Good morning. Welcome to Today in Georgia, coming to you from Stone Mountain. I'm Nancy Scott, and I want to tell you that we've planned this show because there's a Yellow Daisy Festival coming up tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday out here at Stone Mountain with lots of activities, many of which we're going to report on today. We'll be uh, having some fiddling music. We have a group of cloggers that will dance for us. We will talk to a candle maker, a miniature house maker, have a ride on a railroad, and talk to the uh, head horticulturist out here about the Yellow Daisy. So stay with us. from atop Stone Mountain, 1,683 feet above sea level, and one of the very few places that these beautiful yellow daisies bloom and grow. And joining us now is the, well, I call him the chief horticulturist. He says the gardener, Mr. Harold Cox. And I welcome you to the show. Thank you. Is this the only place that the yellow daisies grow? Well, uh, they're not restricted to Stone Mountain. They grow on the granite outcrops in this area, say within a 50 mile, 50 mile radius, 
<coughs> excuse me, of Stone Mountain. But um, the biggest concentration is at Stone Mountain. Well, it's amazing that every place you look and little nooks and cracks and crannies of the mountain, up these daisies come. What do they need to grow? Well, very little. They thrive on a starvation diet. They, uh, the plants release the seed in the fall and the rain washes in all the cracks and the crannies and, and every little place that, uh, uh, that the, the rain can wash them. And uh, they germinate in April and uh, they grow very little in the summer. They maybe grow that much all through the summer. They barely survive and they do succumb to drought. And uh, it's only the, the ones that survive are the ones that live in the deepest soil. And if we have a wet summer, of course, we have more daisies. And uh, a dry summer, we have, we have fewer daisies. I would say that this year was a little below average. But there are still yellow daisies every place I look. That's true, but when we have a good summer, we have literally acres of them. Yes. Uh, what other plants are indigenous to this mountain? Well, we have about uh, a dozen other plants that are, that are indigenous, but most of them are, are, are known as winter annuals. They germinate in the fall, and uh, they flower in the early spring, and then they shrivel up and die, and then we don't see them for the rest of the summer. Whereas the yellow daisy reverses the process. It uh, germinates in the spring, and uh, blooms in September. What would happen if I planted yellow daisies in my garden? Do they actually need the wind beating on them and uh, very little moisture and so forth? Well, I believe that the, uh, they need the, uh, the minerals that are in this granite itself, because it seems that they uh, will only survive on the granite. If you, as you say, take the seed and put them in your own garden, the seed will germinate and uh, the plants grow real lush, grow big and bushy, but they never flower, they just simply die. And uh, at least that's been my experience, because sometimes we get them coming up in the flower beds. And very rarely do they uh, survive to flower. So there are a certain number of plants, including the yellow daisies, that seem to thrive on this mountain. That's right. Well, I think the true explanation is that uh, they have uh, adapted themselves to conditions on the mountain, the very stringent conditions that exist here. And over the centuries, these plants have evolved, and uh, they have adapted themselves to the conditions on the mountain. Well, they're beautiful, and I thank you for talking with us today, Mr. Harold Cox, who is in charge of all of the plants at Stone Mountain. Thank you. Thank you. I'm talking to you from the old grist mill here at Stone Mountain. You know, this weekend there are going to be some 200 craftsmen displaying their wares and actually showing us how a lot of these crafts are done. And a young lady that I want to introduce to you and who will also be here this weekend is Missy Huggins, a candle maker. And I'm so glad you could join me on the show. Well, thank you, Nancy. Well, you're doing something already. Is this the very first step, Missy? Right. We start out with a clear star-shaped mold and soak it about 30 seconds in the hot wax. To soften it? That's correct. And uh, what's your next step? Well, then I uh, put it in the water to cool it off just enough so that the next layer of wax will stick. And then I start putting the colors on. This is all hot dyed wax. Well, how hot do you say it's hot and it's, uh, it's molten, so it's obviously... We keep the wax about 165 degrees. How many times will you actually have to dip a candle? Uh, we usually put around 30 coats of wax on the candle. How do you decide which colors to use? Because you just used blue and I see white. What are some of the other colors you have? Well, we have gold and green and red and brown in this vat. Now, how long does this dipping process take? It takes roughly 15 minutes. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we uh, check with another craftsman who's also going to be displaying this weekend. You keep dipping, and then I'll check back with you in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Missy. 
This is Bill Robinson, who's going to be displaying dollhouses. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Thank show. Thank you, Nancy. Well, this, uh, this dollhouse you were telling me is very old. This dollhouse is uh, over 100 years old. It was made in Germany, and it comes from the Losch family, which is my wife's relatives, and it's been handed down from generation to generation. Is that what interested you in dollhouses in the first place? Well, that and my wife has a large collection of antique and collector's dolls. Well, if this particular dollhouse is over 100 years old, how far back can you authenticate that there were such things as dollhouses? I guess as long as they've been making dolls. In fact, right now they're making doll houses for doll houses. <laughs> I don't quite uh, know how to, to uh, grasp that. But they, that's true, they are. Well, now that's a very old one. Now this, this next house that you will also have on display is a rather new one. Yes? yes, this is a duplicate of my own personal house. And this is what I make for customers who buy doll houses. Uh, if they'll supply me the plans and the drawing of the house that they want duplicated, then I will make it uh, in the same fashion as their original house has been made. How many doll houses do you expect to have on display this weekend? Well, we'll probably, due to the lack of space, only have one. Uh, but we, we display all the time down in Stone Mountain Village. Well, now, I've noticed that these two doll houses are really mostly for adults. Do you make any doll houses for children? Yes, Nancy. Uh, I'm building this A-frame now uh, that is very functional for children. Uh, as you see, it has the green grass outside. It's got full carpeting inside. Comes complete with bathroom, kitchen, two bedrooms, and also a loft, which fits together and will take any type of doll furniture. Of course, to get upstairs, you need a ladder, which also comes with it. And then what you really need after that is some light to show it. And with that, we have this nice little chandelier that hangs from the chain in the center of the living room. I guess it would have to be pretty sturdy. Is, is it sturdy so children can play with it? Oh, yeah. It'll, it'll stand up to anything any 6 to 12-year-old kid can give it, and even an adult, actually. And, so, uh, and now there's a roof that goes on the, the roof top? The roof goes on top. Which, by the way, can be opened from either side so the kids can play with one side of the dollhouse or the other. Well, that's marvelous, Bill. Thanks for sharing it with us, and I'll see you this weekend. Thank you. Come and see us in Stone Mountain Village. Okay. And now I'm going to check on Missy and see how she's doing with her candles. Well, Missy, the last time we checked with you, you were busy dipping. Right. You've obviously finished that. What happens now? Now I carve it while the candle is still warm. Right, in. right. It's so warm that the knife, knife can easily go through it and I'll be able to pull it and stretch it without it breaking off. Okay, and after you cut into that, what happens now? Now I just work my designs around the way I like it. We have about 15 to 20 different cuts and then various combinations of the cuts. So it's going to be every other one you're doing something a little different. Oh, and it comes over to me. Right. How long does it take you all together to carve a candle? It takes, I have about 15 minutes um, to work with the wax before it's too cold. And if it gets too cold, then what happens? There is no way to heat it back up. When, uh, when somebody buys one of your candles, do you tell them they can actually burn it? Doesn't it uh, ruin your design? No, it doesn't. They burn straight down, so... Um, You'll save the outside. That won't be ruined by the flame. Could you put a votive candle in it or something? That's to right. Save it too? Right. You can keep replacing the inside with a votive candle. Well, will you be uh, here all weekend? With, uh, yes, I will. I'll be cutting and carving during the festival. So people could actually come by and watch you do one from start to finish. That's right. Well, I really appreciate you talking with us today. And uh, it's a fascinating craft. I'm going to try and stop by and watch the whole process myself. Well, good. I hope to see you. Okay.
is Barbara Mashira, who is the director and the instructor for the North Georgia Sweethearts, and I'm so pleased to have you on the show. Thank you. We're delighted to be here. We have a Yellow Daisy Festival taking place this weekend. Will the cloggers uh, be participating? Yes, they'll be here on Sunday afternoon. Dancing? Yes, uh huh. You also have uh, other groups that yes, you instruct. Yes, I have seven other groups, starting with the Pee Wees and going on up to 50 plus. Where, uh, where's the group from? Cumming, Georgia. And how long have they been dancing together? Uh, this particular group, about three or four years. I have had some groups together for about eight, but this particular one, not that long. Well, not that long, still and all, with the ages that the group is, three or four years is a big chunk of their lifetime. Yes, it is. They came up from the Pee Wee group, most of them. Are they all excited about performing here? I guess it'll be a regular hoedown with groups competing against Oh, yes, they're all excited about it. Well, we wish you the very best of luck in, uh, in the competition Sunday afternoon. And uh, thanks for joining us. Will they do another, another yes, number? Yes, uh -huh. thank you. David Irwin, fiddler, and I'm glad you're going to fiddle for us. Thank you. I hear you're going to be performing out here this weekend. Yes, I will be. I'll be in the uh, competition on Saturday that starts at 11 and goes until whenever. And um, Is there some sort of jam session Friday evening? Friday night there'll be a jam session starting at 7.30, and everybody's welcome, so That's great. bring your fiddle in. Well, what are you going to play for us now? Uh, Orange Blossom Special. Okay, let's, let's hear it.
joining us today. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow when we'll be coming to you from Stone Mountain. In the meantime, have a lovely day, and I'll see you in the morning because I think this train's about ready to leave. This has been Today in Georgia from Stone Mountain, pre-recorded. Stay tuned now for Wheel of Fortune coming up next here on Channel 2. And welcome to Today in Georgia, again coming to you from Stone Mountain Park. And right now I'm speaking to you from the top of the riverboat, just one of the exciting places and things we'll be doing this morning. We'll be cooking cornbread and black-eyed peas over an open hearth fire. Lena Weaver joins us for that. We'll be learning how to call hogs. We'll have an expert talk to us about the carving on the side of the mountain. But we're going to open up the show right now with the North Georgia Bluegrass Band. And here they are.
to you from inside the cookhouse of the antebellum plantation at Stone Mountain, a house that was built in the mid-1800s in a town that was called Whitney and then Dickey and finally moved to Stone Mountain in 1961. And joining us now is Alina Weaver, uh, an extraordinary cook who uses an open fire. And I'm so glad that you're going to do some cooking for us today, Lena. Okay. How long have you been cooking out here? Eight years. And where in the world did you learn to cook on an open fire? My grandmama, from Be my grandmama down here in Gwinnett County. And uh, that, that was the only way they had to cook then? Yeah. Do many people want to know from you now how to cook on an open fire? Yes, ma'am, so sure do. It's kind of like an art that was forgotten and now yeah. people want to Yeah, people want to do it now and they don't know how. So they have to come to people like you to teach them. <laughs> That's right. Well, now, you've got a pot that's already on the fire. What you, what's in there cooking? Black-eyed peas. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Now, how long will it take to cook black-eyed peas on the they fire? They already done. They takes about an hour and a half. What all do you put in them? Salt pork. Mm -hmm. Sounding good. What yeah. are you going to fix for us now? Some cornbread, some old-fashioned cornbread. Well, if you'll just proceed and kind of tell us how you're doing it as okay. you go along. Okay, I'm sifting the meal right now. And uh, this is unbolted stone ground cornmeal. Yes. Was it, was it ground out here first? Yes, ma'am, down at the little grit mill. We saw the grist mill on yesterday's show. So. Yeah. About how much you sifting? I'm going to sift about five cups full. Okay. You have many people come through this uh, little cookhouse and, and uh, want samples of your good cooking? Oh, yes, yeah. lots of them. Lena, let's sort of pretend that it was a uh, hundred years ago and then that, uh, that mm -hmm. plantation was in full service mm -hmm. and the cooking was done over here. Then what was done with the food? They carried it to the main house and put it in the warming kitchen and then they served it out to the companions. Well, why didn't they have the cookhouse as part of the main house? Because they was fair fine. They had more in the main house than they did in a frame kitchen. It, because they were what? They were fair fire. Fire, ah. And they had more money in the main house than they did in a frame kitchen. And they, if the kitchen burnt down, it'd be easy built back, but their home would not be. I got you. <laughs> okay, makes sense. <laughs> What's your favorite recipe to cook in an open fire? Anything. Most anything. anything. What, all, what all do you cook in, out here? Well, I have cooked fried chicken, creamed potatoes, potato carbon pies, baked ham, turkeys. Right in the fire. Right how, over the open fire. How about, you keep sifting and tell me, what, uh, do you cook over an open fire at your house or do you have modern? Uh, I got modern convenience. I got gas. Which way do you prefer to cook? Well, I just likes to cook, and it don't matter. Okay. Anything what? eatable, I can cook it. Okay, it don't what, what else is going in our cornbread now? I'm going to put soda and salt and a little bit of shortening and buttermilk. Sounds good. Would you use those same ingredients if you were going to bake it in an oven at home? Yes, ma'am. Just sift it. My meal and y'all. Now, what are you going to do with this? I'm going to throw that away. Okay. That's the brand. This is my soda. Okay. Well, now, you're putting that in by hand. Do you ever measure your ingredients? No. I just go by the feelings of it. Does it always turn out the same? Same way. Do you always use the same ingredients? Mm -hmm. Same thing. And just by the feel of it, you can kind of tell how much needs to go in. Uh -huh. Okay, now what kind of skillet is that you're using? This is a three-leg spider. So that's going to go right in your fire? Uh, right down on the hearth on some coals. I don't suppose many people today uh, have even seen a spider. No, because they... They came through here, you know, and they asked me what kind of skillet this is. I tell them it's a three-leg spider. They said, well, I said, we ain't never seen one before. 
So I told him, well, you hardly ever can see them. This is my buttermilk. Mm -mm, I see it down in there. Looks mm -hmm. good. Pour me about a cup and a half of buttermilk. Mm -hmm. And then go the other way with water. What do you mean, go the other way with water? Soften it up. Get it, you know, limber where I can put it in the skillet. Mm -hmm. So that's all the buttermilk that I use. And use about, I mean, about dip and a half of water to limb it up so I can put it in the skillet. How many logs do you have to use on a fire a day to get all your cooking done? About four. I mean, about two at the time, about six. So you do it about three, you, you uh, stoke up your fire about three times a day? Three times a day. Well, after this is all mixed, you're gonna put it in your uh, spider oh, and then uh, put it right in the coals? Yes, right down on the hood, in some coals. Gonna dip my coals out put them down on the hearth and then I set my bread over it and let it stay about 15 minutes and then I cover it with a lid. Okay. Use any special kind of wood? Any special kind burn better than others? Hardwood. Hardwood. Yeah, oak, hickory. This smells like hickory today, I suppose. Mm -hmm. it, is it? It's oak. It's red oak. It's what I'm burning today. It's red oak. Now, he all ready to go on the fire. Were you going to put it in for us? Yes. In a minute. Rinse off your hands. Mm -hmm. You have to haul in the water? Toad it in from out in the back. Now I'm ready to shove out my coals now and put it down. Okay. Right here while Jenna put it. Let it stay on these coals about 15 minutes. And then I put my hot lead, you see I got in the fire, put it on top. Oh, so you've got that lid in there, uh, uh -huh. heating. Heating up. That's what I put on top. This is a hot job in here, Lena. That yeah. fire puts out a lot of heat. Yeah. But I stuck with it a good while, though. I did it a good while, though. I imagine you did. I imagine <laughs> you did. Well, we're going to let that cook. We're going to turn off our cameras and let that cook up, and then will you give me a sample of your black-eyed peas and your cornbread? Mm -hmm. Okay. I sure will. Well, the vittles are all ready. Black-eyed peas and cornbread. You gonna lift it up and let me see what's in there? That's what's been smelling. Mm -hmm. That's black-eyed peas. And over here is the cornbread. If you want a sample, I give you, I must give you one right here. Right off no Northern Fire. How old are you, Lena? 62. Well, you've been cooking a lot of years then. I sure have. I covered a lot of ground. <laughs> How many people you suppose you fed in 62 years? I wouldn't have a slight idea. Your beans are out of this world. Thank you. What's your Be favorite? You want black eyed peas, butter beans, string beans, anything either. <laughs> Would you like to have some? Butter on this? I'd like just a little, please. Mmm, those black eyed peas are so good. Now I'm going to try this cornbread. You see get your how piece you like too. That. It's 
see how you like that. I'll tell you, my oven never made it like this. Well, thanks for visiting with us today on Today in Georgia. And um, we're going to take a little break. Lena and I, obviously, are going to just eat some of this good food. Thanks, Lena. Okay, ain't they welcome to it? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> okay, and who's the leader of this fearless group? I guess I am. You guess. What's your name? Chris Why? You are? Larry Say. David Potter. Ron Arrington. Jim Cavanaugh. Trish Roach. Well, what great fun to have you with us. I understand there's some uh, activity out here tonight. Yes, there's going to be a big jam session at the uh, undercover tent place. I think it's called uh, Covered Coliseum. Covered Coliseum, right. right. That's it. Yeah, they're going to be a big jam session. There'll probably be a lot of pickers just, uh, well, doing just what they say, jam. It's just going to get together and pick. And then tomorrow, there's uh, tomorrow, some competition. Right. Tomorrow, they'll have bluegrass music competition, and uh, we'll probably, more than likely, be in the band competition and uh, a few of the other individual instrument competition. Right. I understand that uh, the musicians who are interested can register between 9 and 11, and all the uh, competition starts at 11, yes? Right. Yes, I believe that's the way it goes. There's a booth down there. Well, the name of your group is North Georgia Bluegrass Band, but where are you actually from? Well, we're scattered all around. Some of us are from uh, Florida, and some of us are from Georgia, and uh, I'm from West Virginia. We just sort of met in Athens. In Athens, that's where you play now? Yes, right. We have uh, several jobs there. We do regular jobs there. Well, I love your music, and if it doesn't wake folks up at this time of the morning, nothing's gonna. <laughs> How about one more num number? Sure, be glad to. What's it gonna be? Um, this one is called Fox on the Run. Okay. This is Nancy on the Run.
We're looking from a quarter of a mile away at Stone Mountain and the largest sculpture in the world. And here to tell us a little bit about that carving is Neil Pedigo, who is the tour director at Stone Mountain Park. Neil, who actually did the carving? Well, we had three artists, Nancy. The first was Gutsum Borglum, the second was Augustus Lukeman, and the third one was Walker Hancock. Mr. Borglum carved from, 25, from 23 to 25. Mr. Lukeman carved from 25 to 28. And then there was nothing done on the side of the mountain from 1928 to 1964, when Mr. Walker Hancock uh, was retained by the state. And from 1964 to 1970, when the dedication was held. Who is on the mountain? Well, reading from right, reading from left to right, we have Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. And who, who was it planned as a tribute to? Well, it was a tribute to the Confederacy, mainly to General Robert E. Lee. How big is the carving? Oh, the carving is the largest piece of sculptural art in the world. It is, in size, uh, larger than a football field. I heard that it was larger than a city block. Yes, it is. It's larger than a <laughs> city block. Uh -huh. what, uh, what are some other little facts well, about it? Well, uh, the first horse's mouth can hold a six-foot man standing straight and tall. It's hard to believe viewing it from this far yes, away. Yes, you're viewing it a fourth of a mile away. The first horse's eyes are larger than a bushel basket. From the tip end of the nose of uh, Davis's horse's nose, to the tip end of the cape is 191 feet. From uh, Lee's head to the fading out of his sword is 90 feet. So we say the actual carving is 191 by 90 feet. If you had to give us some estimate as, the, as to the size of Stone Mountain itself, could you do that? Yes. Uh, there are 14 exposed acres on this outcropping. And for a 100-mile radius, you're standing on the lap of the Stone Mountain granite. This takes in the states of South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. And we asked Tech, Georgia Tech, to give us a calculation of the weight of the 583 acres that are exposed. And this is what they came with us. They gave us 1,264,745,000 thousand at 505 pounds and Nancy if everybody who has ever lived took a fourth of a pound of the granite away from the carving uh, away from the mountain as it remains today you would still have 98 percent remaining unbelievable it is unbelievable it is the world's largest mass of granite thank you so much thank you Nancy I've enjoyed being with you Nell Pedigo and now for something very serious hog calling <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's got to be the funniest thing I ever heard. This is Terry Coker, of really not an official hog caller, but I'm glad you showed us out. Oh, I enjoyed doing it. <laughs> I can't it's, stop laughing. That's it's hilarious. Interesting. We try it every year, and we have quite a few people from the crowds come up every year. And uh, we've had one gentleman win two years in a row from uh, North Georgia Mountains, but it's been getting better because we've gotten more people each year to join. And we're looking forward to it this year. We hope for at least 25 or 30 people. And anybody that wants to, it's open to the public. So it's also part of the Yellow Daisy Festival then? Yes, ma'am, it is part. It takes place at noon on Saturday. It's uh, the break between the Bluegrass Festival and the Mountain Music Contest. So it's also in that covered coliseum that yes, they have? Yes, ma'am, it is in the covered coliseum located near the stable area where the crafts and across from the meadow where the barbecue dinner and what have you. But... In other words, you don't have to be a, a professional hog caller to enter this contest. No, ma'am, we haven't had any professionals <laughs> enter yet. If we did, it would be a shut and closed case. Most of them are really amateurs. Uh, the forestry department enjoys entering. They have two divisions located near here, and both of them enter and challenge each other each year. Well, I'll tell you what, just to close out this segment, how about just one more call for us? Okay. There's no way I'm going to try that. <laughs> Well, 
we've had a great time out here at Stone Mountain the past two days. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. You know, the Yellow Daisy Festival continues today and the rest of the weekend out here. And you have a great weekend regardless, and I'll see you Monday morning. Bye-bye. Today in Georgia at Stone Mountain has been a color presentation of WSB Television as a community involvement program. Stay tuned now for Wheel of Fortune, next on The People's Choice. He had so much, he was a life enhancer. Everywhere you went with George, it was fun. And he was also interested in, mostly in himself, but peripherally in you. And if he really made a point of pinning his attention down on you, he was a wonderful friend. Mm -hmm. um, he was uh, a flirt. And I didn't realize it for a long time. I found out later when I married my husband, Moss Hart, that the waltz that he told me he'd written for me uh, was his mating call. <laughs> you mean he wrote a walk, and whoever he dated, he says, Lovey, I wrote this just for you. That's right. And he hoped yes. you never all got together and hummed, and you'd find out, right? <laughs> well, we never did. I never did, anyway. I also knew that part of his, you know, in the old days, they used to say, come up and see my etchings. George would say, come up, I, I need your help in orchestrating Porgy and Bess. <laughs> And you say, summertime. <laughs> yes, and then he'd say, would you mind singing this phrase? Because I, I'd like to hear it, and then I can change the orchestration a little. He'd pick up a pencil, obviously a dummy pencil. <laughs> Wouldn't change a note, but I fell for the whole thing. <laughs> That's wonderful. So if he called you up and said, let's go out tonight, you'd say, where are we going? What would he say, to a piano? Well, no, actually he took me to El Morocco. Did he? And we a danced a lot, big nightclub. We danced a lot. He was a wonderful dancer. Could he dance? I mean, Arthur Schwartz says he could dance, and Fred Astaire says he couldn't dance. Well, in You Fred danced with him. I don't think Fred did. In Fred Astaire's <laughs> terms, he couldn't dance. In my terms, he was a great dancer. And we were both slightly egotistical in those days because we'd go to El Morocco and we'd bet on whose song would be played first because I'd been in the movies then and I'd sung some songs that were fairly well known. Mm -hmm. And uh, But his ego was charming. Uh, he never practiced the piano because he played on everybody else's piano. Did he ever take lessons? Did he ever study with anybody? Well, he once uh, cabled Ravel that he wanted to study with him. Ravel, a famous French modern composer. And Ravel cabled back, how much money do you make? I guess he thought maybe a poor student, you know, didn't have the money to go to Paris. George cabled back $100,000 and Ravel cabled him and said, you stay where you are, I'll come study with you. <laughs> But he was an innate genius. I mean, he was born playing the piano, and everywhere he went, he nobody was... was offended if he came to your house and he sat down at the piano. No, but after a long time, guests really did want to talk to each other. <laughs> there was a slight feeling of malaise after a long, long time. And George Kaufman once said that when George Gershwin's musicals opened, his friends felt as though they were revivals. <laughs> <laughs> They'd all heard the song so much. <laughs> We lost you. We lost a very nice lady. And I'm glad you're with us today, Kitty Carlisle. Thank you for bringing back your memories of George Gershwin on this would have been his 80th birthday. And now we're going to hear some more Gershwin sung by Barbara Lee with Ronnie at the piano. Old man sunshine, listen you. Never tell me dreams come true. 
Just try it, and I'll start a riot. Beatrice Fairfax, don't you dare ever tell me he will care. I'm certain it's the final curtain. I never want to hear from any cheerful Pollyannas who tell you fate supplies a mate. It's all bananas. They're writing songs of love, but not for me. A lucky star's above, but not for me. With love to lead the way, I've found more clouds of gray than any Russian play could guarantee. I was a fool to fall and get that way. I ho alas, and also lack a day. Although I can't dismiss the memory of his kiss, I guess he's not for me. I could cry salty tears. How long has this been going on? There were chills up my spine. There were thrills I can't define. Hear me, sweet, I repeat. How long has this been going on? I'm hurt. I know how Columbus felt finding another world. Kiss me once, then once more. What a dunce I was before. What a brave. For heaven's sake, how long has this been going on? How long has this been going on? Wasn't that nice? Oh, my. Thank you, Barbara Lee. Thank you, Ronnie White. And thank you, Miss Marvelous, Mrs. Morse Hart, and <laughs> Kitty Carlyle. Thank you. We'll be back after this message. Watch this big truck run over a Spring Air back supporter mattress. See? Tire marks, but no damage to Spring Air's exclusive inner spring unit. The back supporter springs still function perfectly. Try the unique back supporter mattress, made only by Spring Air. See your local Spring Air dealer. Crunch is a Jimmy Now Nature Valley Granola Bar. Yeah! They're great! Crunchy Nature Valley Granola Bars. Wholesome, all-natural treats in honey and oats, cinnamon, coconut, and peanut flavors. No additives or preservatives. Snack goes granola. Hey, weren't you here before? And you, and you, and you. <laughs> Nature Valley Granola Bars. Some people can't get enough of them. Snack goes granola. 
That was nice stuff that we were just listening to, George Gershon. I mean, it's quite remarkable when you look at all of those titles that he wrote, Summertime, and The Man I Love, and Rhapsody in Blue, and it goes on and on and on. Some people hope for one hit in their life and all of that. Well, to kind of carry you off into this day, it is Tuesday after all. You need a little fascinating rhythm, so we're <laughs> going to provide that for you. We're going to go off the program now with fascinating rhythm. Got a little rhythm, a rhythm, a rhythm, a pity pats through my brain. So darn persistent, the day isn't distant when it'll drive me insane. Comes in the morning without any warning and hangs around all day. I'll have to sneak up to it someday and speak up to it. I hope it listens when I say. Fascinating rhythm, you got me on the go. Fascinating rhythm, I'm all a quiver. What a mission making, the neighbors want to know why I'm always shaking just like a fliver. Each morning I get up with the sun. Start a hopper, never stopping to find at night no work has been done. I know that once it didn't matter, but now you're doing wrong when you start your patter. I'm so unhappy. Why not take a day off, decide to run along somewhere far away off and make it snappy? Oh, how I long to be the man I used to be. Fascinating rhythm, oh, won't you stop picking on me? There it goes again now, fascinating rhythm, you got me on the go. Fascinating rhythm, I'm all a quiver. What a mess you're making, the neighbors want to know why I'm always shaking just like a fliver. Each morning I get up with the sun. Battered, starring LeVar Burton, Karen Grassley, Mike Farrell, and Joan Blondell. The real story of women who must find a way to fight back. Battered, Tuesday at 9, 8 Central and Mountain. Suzanne Summers in Zuma Beach. It's the last day of summer, and the sun and the sand are hot. When this day ends, no one's life will be the same. Zuma Beach, Wednesday at 9, 8 Central and Mountain. Good morning, everyone. This is today. It's Tuesday, September 26th. And in the news headlines this morning, FAA officials are trying to learn why two planes collided over San Diego, killing at least 150 people. Throughout the full two hours of today, this morning, we're going to be showing you videotape scenes of one of NBC's premier affiliates. There it is, station WSB in Atlanta, Georgia. That's the home office of the Cox Broadcasting Corporation. It has prospered and it has done well over the years, despite the fact that I once worked there in that very building. Known Atlanta, affectionately, as White Columns on Peachtree. WSB Channel 2 in Atlanta, Georgia. 25 years old this week, and our best congratulations to them. Good morning, all. I'm Tom Brokaw, here with Jane Pauley and with Gene Shelley. Good, Good morning, morning, folks. How are you? During this half hour, we're going to get into the, uh, some of the stories behind the story and that San Diego tragic airplane crash yesterday. At least 150 people killed. FAA investigators are looking into it. And today in Washington, there will be congressional testimony from uh, John O'Donnell. He is the president of the Airline Pilots Association. He's going to be talking about air, uh, air safety procedures that should be installed at San Diego and other airports around the country. He's there in our Washington News Center this morning with James Polk. And so we'll be talking to him about how accidents of that kind can be avoided in the future. A tragic accident in San Diego. 
a little uh, a little more harmonious note coming up later in the hour, however. Indeed, there is. You know what we got? Later in the hour, we're going to be observing the 80th birthday of George Gershwin, one of America's greatest composers, the wonderful George Gershwin.